rightly or wrongly, I think we all expect the lights to come on when we flip the switch. It is a fundamental part of our cultural existence today. Electricity, it's, it's essential service. And so we gotta make sure we bring that every hour of the day and we gotta do it in a reliable fashion and it needs to be affordable. It's rural America. I mean, again, it is farmers, it's manufacturing, it's all that, that backbone. Those are the people that we're serving and trying to make their lives better, easier, providing low cost, affordable power. Banding together and forming Wabash Valley Power, I think the driving force of that is just so that they could have economies of scale, come together, share risk, and be big enough to be in those markets. Having the, the vision to do this, I, I think it's just tremendous. Cooperatives go clear back, actually, to, to the mid-1700s. In fact, Benjamin Franklin formed the first cooperative. It was a mutual fire insurance company. The cooperative really took off on the electric side, probably back in the 1930s, uh, when uh, FDR passed some legislation. Investor-owned utilities were bringing electricity to cities, to populated areas. They were not bringing it to the country for a very legitimate reason. Obviously, when you get out in the country, rural areas, you got to extend lines that go out a long ways to get to maybe just one house. It takes decades to get a return on investment under that business model. So there was no interest. Uh, there simply was no one willing to go do it. The farmers, seeing their city counterparts, if you will, enjoying light and services that they didn't have access to, simply band together form a cooperative and go apply for a loan. And that's exactly what happened across the country in the rural areas. So that's when co-ops step in, get formed, and uh, make sure everybody has an opportunity. You had individual member distribution co-ops who were purchasing their electricity from the investor owns, had absolutely no leverage in that negotiation. No leverage. You can do so much more collectively with so many more co-ops than you can individually. It would affect the rate that you pay for power and, and down the line what you have to charge our member systems. Banning together and forming another cooperative, Wabash Valley Power, gave them the opportunity to have some autonomy and have some influence over the decision-making process. And that's why Wabash Valley was formed. We really had to uh, learn as we go because we were not too experienced at what we were doing. It's an extremely complicated business and I think it's incredible to me that the vision that that took. Setting aside your differences, whatever they may be, and say, okay, this is for the betterment of everybody and this is a need going forward. I, I think that was just astounding, you know, vision at the time. Trying to find a way to collectively share costs and the risk and the expertise to provide power that's affordable and reliable to our members at the end of the line. So we ended up being kind of an extension of what they were already doing. Because of its financial issues early on, it was not able to really get into generation. But it became obvious, particularly in the early 2000s, that they really needed to be able to have steel in the ground, as they say. I have been told that every chairman has, a, has something on his mind when he's chairman and I was told that I had steel, and I guess I did. I thought, you know, if we're gonna be a and t we ought to at least have some generation. And so that developed into a more diversified portfolio of where there is some market-oriented purchase, and there are also some owned generation. And, that, and that's important to keep balance, not only between owned and purchased power, but also between the, the diversity of the type of power. And so there's a desire to say, hey, let's go beyond the paper GT, let's own assets. And Marble Hill was probably the first step toward that. And it was a huge step. Uh, unfortunately, it did not work well. Marble Hill was a nuclear plant. Wabash Valley went in with, at the time, Public Service Indiana. Got into that project. 
and um, the cost started to rise. And then you had the Three Mile Island event. It was the first step in a nuclear nightmare. As far as we know, at this hour, no worse than that. But a government official said that a breakdown in an atomic power plant in Pennsylvania today is probably the worst nuclear reactor accident to date. Because of that, that caused a disruption to any utility that was doing any type of uh, nuclear plants at that point in time. The governor put together a task force to decide whether or not to continue the project. The recommendation of the task force was to shut it down. And uh, construction eventually stopped in 1984. There was billions of dollars that were invested in, in a plant that obviously never went in service. Didn't turn out well for us uh, from that standpoint. I got the letter from the Justice Department. The Board of Directors got the letter from the Justice Department telling us that we were personally liable for Marble Hill. Well, it was a kind of a short letter which got everybody's attention. I, I think it drove us together. I think it made us stronger that way. Ed used to say, give me a bunch of farmers because they'll fight, and I kind of took that as a compliment. And we all stuck together, and uh, I deeply appreciate that. I'll always deeply appreciate the, the willingness of all those people to say, uh, we're going we're gonna to stay with this thing. When you go through a bankruptcy like that, Wabash Valley was, was not going a good direction. And um, Ed Martin uh, was the CEO at that time. He ended up getting Wabash Valley from a financial standpoint, uh, really in a better position. I think he's a legend in this industry. Again, I, I go back to that word visionary. I think he was instrumental in bringing those co-ops together. That, that was Ed, and I think he was the driving force, you know, getting us through bankruptcy. And what is that next step? big lesson we learned and a lesson that we carry forward to today is let's not have all our eggs in one basket. After you were all in for Marble Hill, it was time to be all in for nothing. And after that, you wanted to be a little bit here and a little bit there. And so that was that was pretty much our goal. Uh, we did not go in and, and make huge investments in any single thing. And I'm very proud that we had that diversified portfolio. And Rick Coons has to be proud of that. I mean, he was, he was very much the guy that really led that through. We went out and, and negotiated a lot of power deals and it made us think a little bit more about diversification of risk and that sort of thing. As we diversify, we buy some, we generate some, we have gas, we have coal, we have renewables, we have multiple locations, multiple units, so that diversity is a, a huge risk mitigation. It's really served us well and not only from the types of resources but also the, the terms of the resources. We don't have everything ending in one, one year. Some of our contracts maybe are short term, some are going to be medium term, some are going to be long term. So a lot of different ways to have some diversity within your portfolio to help address risk. Today, Wabash Valley enjoys one of the most diverse portfolios from a generation perspective uh, of any cooperative, rg and We were in bankruptcy for 10 years and that was probably the toughest 10 years I've been employed. But then when we came out, we kind of had develop a plan to kind of right herself and uh, become more credit worthy and start to own more assets. Coming out of bankruptcy, it's very difficult to borrow money under those conditions. And so you have to have a pretty strong balance sheet in order to be able to borrow money at a reasonable interest rate. And the market puts a strong emphasis on, hey, if we're gonna do business with you in the future, you need to have a strong credit presence. It's much like your personal credit rating. The better credit rating you have, the more people that want to lend you money, the better rates that you get when you borrow money. Power providers, they at least know that you're credit worthy, you're not some fly-by-night kind of group, and they're willing to work with you, give you long-dated deals and better terms. So it became very clear that building the financial stability of the organization was extremely important. And that's where we just said, uh, let's look at getting a credit rating. We approached Standard & Poor's, and they came out and gave us uh, an A- minus credit rating. And I remember everybody was very pleased. Now we're an A company, not A-, minus, so we did get upgraded, so that's even better. So we have hundreds of millions of dollars worth of credit now relative to that. It's very important, one of the backbones of our financial strategy. After uh, Rick had retired as CEO of Wabash Valley, Jay joined us. 
I think he was able to obviously see, coming from the outside, that we had some blind spots. Jay brought an interesting concept to Wabash Valley Power. There was actually revenue to be made by owning transmission. To that point, he was one that identified that having an operations center would be uh, necessary to carry out that strategy. We also got a new building in place uh, that has the operations center. And uh, so it's a new headquarters for us. It's been absolutely wonderful, a uh, really good tool for attracting employees, which we needed to do. Uh, his leadership got us to that point. So I, again, I can't say enough about Jay and, and what he brought to Wabash Valley, that new perspective. I think that's Jay's legacy is that it served us well and I think the members are really happy with the, the strides we made in reliability of the system. We got a lot of good things going on at Wabash Valley and we would prefer to tell our story versus if we don't, somebody's gonna tell it for us and they may not get it right. So that's kind of how we viewed making sure that we put a report together related to ESG. ESG stands for Environmental Social Governance. I don't think it's necessarily things that we are doing drastically different because ESG has now become a buzzword, but I think it's just, you have a report, you're talking about it. By 2050, we hope to be carbon neutral. It's an aspirational goal. It's just a kind of a natural progression of where we were going anyway. It's not an absolute, things are gonna change, but you know, I think it was important to make it realistic and achievable. The social aspects of ESG are extraordinarily important, not only to the communities we serve, but also to the employees of, of Wabash Valley. The things that they do in their communities every day, Project Roundup is a term you might hear, you know, you can round up your bill to the next dollar and then they take all of that money and reinvest it in the community. There's hundreds of those types of projects throughout the community. So that's very much, I think, where we have a unique spin on the ESG because we are owned by those members and they are in those communities. The governance model in Wabash Valley's case is literally owned by the 23 cooperatives that make up our members of Wabash Valley. 19 RMCs in the state of Indiana, three in the state of Illinois, one in the state of Missouri. 380 some thousand people who actually are served through those distribution co-ops by Wabash Valley Power. Each one of the 23 members then seats a director on our board and they set the direction of the company. These people live in the communities they're serving. Each of those 23 members has one boat in the boardroom, regardless of size. And that is, that is one of the distinctive characteristics of cooperatives. I mean, obviously management provides recommendations, but the board as a whole, they determine what, is our, what are our rates going to be for next year? Are we investing in this plant or not? Or what, what are we doing? A variety of backgrounds. 23 different perspectives. Diversity of opinions coming together in one common cause. The people that are living in the communities are the ones making the decisions here. You never get too old to learn or to accept change because uh, the old expression, you know, well, we didn't used to do it that way. I don't, I don't go for that because I think we are in a world of change and uh, we have to be ex accepting it. Electricity is an essential service. People expect it and they're going to expect it even more down the road. From an industry standpoint, we're, we're going through what I call the great transition. We're trying to move from fossil fuel toward assets that don't emit carbon, which are going to be renewables. We're trying to, as this industry, make that move and at the same time do it in a way where it's still affordable and also that we provide reliable power. Renewables are great, but when the sun doesn't shine, the wind doesn't blow, you get nothing. People are beginning to understand you can't destabilize the grid and not have electricity. And so it's gonna take a very diverse portfolio to maintain the reliability of the grid. It's just a unique time in our industry right now. We have a lot of things going on that could be pivotal changes in our industry. So I think that's the challenge, just to figure out where those are gonna go and then how we're going to adapt to that. 
So providing that reliable, affordable electricity is going to become even more important going into the future. We haven't lost the focus on the community piece of it. And I think it's important for what we're trying to do because there's a lot of underserved communities. If your customers believe you're doing the right thing and you're establishing ESG goals and you're living up to their expectations, then what you're establishing is, is actually member loyalty. I'm very pleased with where we're at today in our overall power supply portfolio. On the generation side, we own about 1,000 or 1,100 megawatts of owned assets. A little over 400 megawatts combined uh, between solar and wind under contract. So that's been a nice addition to our portfolio. Obviously, there's no carbon emissions with those resources. If we do our job, be member first and make sure that we're doing everything to help our distribution members so that they can help the retail member at the end of the line, um, I think those numbers, while they're incredibly strong now, I think they can only get better if, if we continue to uh, kind of carry that forward and that's, that's our plan. Of all businesses, co-ops enjoy the greatest customer satisfaction than any other business model or any other business, as a matter of fact, because the members are very loyal to the co-ops that they actually own. We're a nonprofit. We're doing meaningful work by providing an essential service. It's a sense of family and much more community oriented. You know, we don't have shareholders, so we're not beholden to the shareholders and you know, profit. So that gives them a lot of autonomy to do what they think is right. The cooperative model is focused around the member, and that's why I am an unabashed believer that it is the best business model if you want to serve customers. We've got a good group here that uh, is buying into that and, and have over the many, many years, and, and it's exciting to see uh, how that's coming about.